there's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking just rocking in a way that's true if you know what I mean just take a look at the senior scene well it's rocking so good morning my name is Sydney Sims I'm the programs and operations manager here at the Seymour Center and today I'm glad to bring to you all a wonderful program which is coffee and pastry with the author so our first author that's going to be um, presenting today is Bill Andrews e he is E. Maynard Adams Professor of English, Emeritus, UNC Chapel Hill. So today, Bill um, is going to talk with you a little bit about how social status and class developed among the enslaved in the first half of the 19th century. So ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together, round of applause for Bill Andrews. Let's welcome him. Well, thank you for coming out. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I appreciate being invited. Uh, I want to thank Sidney Sims and Robin Balin for, for uh, facilita facilitating this. I, I, want, I want you to know that um, my chief claim to fame is that um, about 35 years ago, I convinced Sharon Fenbert to marry me. <laughs> and um, after that, everything went great. <laughs> First, I'm going to read a condensed version of the preface of this book, and then that will explain why understanding American slavery is fundamental to an honest and complete understanding of the national character and identity of the United States from its inception to the present day. And then I'll talk about why class among the enslaved is basic to an understanding of slavery itself. First from the preface, I was born in Richmond, Virginia in 1946 in a hospital on Monument Avenue named in honor of Robert E. Lee's cavalry commander, James Ewell Brown Jeb Stewart. Among my paternal and maternal forebears are more men who fought for the Confederacy than I can easily count. Half of my great-great-grandfathers were slaveholders. The others, as far as I can tell, weren't. In the 1860 U.S. Census, Edwin Garnett Andrews, 1805 to 1861, of Caroline County, Virginia, claimed six human beings ranging in age from four months to 53 years as his property. John Fernieho, Jr., 1788 to 1860, a prosperous coachmaker enjoyed the profits of a small estate near Fredericksburg, Virginia, maintained by 16 men and women whom he enslaved. In 1835, Fernie Ho, my great-great-grandfather, a public-spirited gentleman, joined an anti-abolition vigilance committee in Fredericksburg, the purpose of which was, according to a local newspaper, to aid the civil authorities in detecting and bringing to justice the abolitionists engaged in disseminating their nefarious publications and prosecuting their incendiary projects. These two great-great-grandfathers of mine would never have imagined that a descendant of theirs would one day devote 40 years of his life to studying, interpreting, editing, and reprinting nefarious publications of American abolitionism that Fernie Ho and his committee tried to criminalize and suppress. Though undoubtedly an outrage to slaveholders like Fernieho, the narratives of former slaves who testified against chattel slavery have become for me the most instructive and inspiring, albeit often appalling, human documents ever produced by the 19th century South. From the slave narratives, I've realized that along with democracy, capitalism, Protestant Christianity, and marriage, Slavery was so powerful and pervasive as to constitute the fifth of these five fundamental institutions that de defined America from its inception. So I want to go through these institutions, beginning with 
the defining political institution of the United States, which of course democracy, representative democracy. But from its founding, the U.S. denied the franchise to anyone who was enslaved, of course, and in many northern states before the Civil War, to anyone of African descent. The notorious Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, by which the slave states were permitted to count each enslaved individual in their population as three-fifths of a per person for the purposes of congressional appoint apportionment, perverted the Constitution of the United States and made it a pro-slavery document from the beginning of the country. Turning to economics, what is the predominant defining economic institution of the United States? Of course, it's capitalism. But before the Civil War, free enterprise and free markets had little meaning to enslaved African Americans, despite the fact that their minds and bodies were the most profitable commodities made in America. Moving on to religion, what is the dominant defining religious institution of the United States? It is Protestant Christianity. The basic tenet of Protestantism was and is the priesthood of all believers. In its most radical form, this revolutionary idea prescribed literacy for the laity so that each Christian could read the Bible and become his or her own interpreter of the scriptures. But in the southern slaveocracy, the idea of slaves reading and interpreting the Bible freely was anathema. The interests of slavery defiled and in many cases blunted the central evangelical aim of Protestant Christianity in half the United States. Now to the social realm. I would argue the defining institution of the young Republican re Republic in the social realm was marriage and the nuclear family. But in this area, slavery's corrosive effects in the South were perhaps most damaging and therefore most often denied. For the enslaved, family ties could be sundered whenever a slaver decided to sell a mother, father, son, or daughter. The majority of antebellum slave narratives recount at least one such sale in the narrator's own family. The narratives also record many instances in which slaveholders fathered children by enslaved women. For instance, William Grimes' father was a Virginia blue blood. Many slaveholders had no compunctions about selling their mixed-race offspring for profit or to avoid social scandal. Mary Boykin Chestnut, wife of a leading U.S. senator and a slaveholder from South Carolina, right before the Civil War, confided to her diary, quote, like the patriarchs of old, our men live all in one house with their wives and their concubines. And the mulattoes one sees in every family exactly resemble the white children. And every lady tells you who is the father of all the mulatto children in everybody else's household. But those in her own, she seems to drink, think, drop from the clouds, <laughs> or pretends so to think. With representative democracy, capitalism, Protestant Christianity, and marriage, slavery belongs among the five most influential institutions in the founding and defining of the United States simply because slavery was so deeply rooted in the country that it subverted and defiled the other four. Today, the United States, of course, is still swimming and trying not to drown in the noxious backwash of slavery. One way to chart our course away from destructive misunderstandings of our national past is to consult the personal histories of African American men and women who told the truth about the South under the slaveocracy. Between 1840 and 1865, the narratives of former slaves captured the imaginations and aroused the social conscience of tens of thousands of readers. So that's, a, that's, that's from my preface to my book. Now I want to talk a little bit about slavery and class. The role and function of class. How class, in a way, made slavery work. 
Slavery in the antebellum South was a totalitarian institution. Its aim and its effect were to control the totality of life, even the consciousness of those whose misfortune it was to be born into the caste, not the class, but the caste, that could be labeled Negro or African or black. If there was one question that impelled me to invest the two decades it took me to write this book, this, this one right here, <laughs> this is the question. What enabled the extremely tiny minority of the enslaved who got free, especially through escape to the North? How did they develop the self-esteem confidence and aspiration necessary to believe that somehow they could overcome the odds and attain their liberty. In my book, I argue that social and economic factors built into the system of slavery itself created distinctions among the enslaved that gave rise to and nurtured many of the qualities that enabled the slave narrators to make a radical commitment to personal freedom. The system of slavery divided the enslaved into classes of workers, most of them relatively unskilled, but some highly skilled. The narratives of the most famous people who escaped from slavery uh, show us that almost all of those people were highly skilled while they were enslaved. Skilled workers, many of them living in towns or cities, were in a different class of work from those who were relatively unskilled. The relatively unskilled were the large majority. And they did the agricultural labor, the punishing, dawn to dusk kind of labor that we typically think of as in enslaved labor. But the narratives, the famous slave narratives, and in fact all the slave narratives that I talk about in my book, and I talk about more than 60, the large majority of those narratives were produced by people who were relatively skilled workers. And that made a huge difference in their, difference in their lives. These men and women, the skilled workers, had marketable skills and a keen awareness of how to leverage those skills to their social and economic advantage while they were enslaved. Here are two quotes from uh, slave narratives about uh, bestowed privileges, that is, privileges that someone was never, never went out and earned. They just came to them and made them very fortunate as a result. Harriet Jacobs, who published the most famous slave narrative produced by a woman in the entire 19th century. My, my mistress taught me to read and spell, and for this privilege, which so rarely falls to the lot of a slave, I bless her memory. When Frederick Douglass was eight years old, he was sent from the boondocks of Maryland's eastern shore to become a domestic slave in the big city of Baltimore, a huge advantage. In his second autobiography, Douglas recalled, quote, I was not the only enslaved boy on the plantation that might have been sent to live in Baltimore. There were boys younger, boys older, boys of the same age, belonging to my old master, but the high privilege fell to my lot. From their youth, these two most famous slave narrators in our literature, Harriet Jacobs and Frederick Douglass, received advantages these were the, not the only ones. They also grew up in urban areas rather than on farms. They also came from extended families, tremendously supportive people who were themselves enslaved. Each one had a grandmother in slavery who made a huge impact on their lives. These were all advantages that they had that they certainly considered to have been privileges because the average enslaved man and woman did not have these. Advantages. 
In my book, I show how class not only structured the lives of the enslaved, but also influenced how the slave narratives thought about themselves from their childhood, what they thought about their fellow slaves, and what they thought about the white people whom they had to deal with. If we examine the length and breadth of all of these narratives, not just a few famous ones, which is the ones I've been citing, but all 60 narratives published between 1840 and 1865, which is what I do in my book, we can see how self-awareness and social awareness developed hand in hand among the enslaved. We discovered that the lives of the majority of the slave narrators were characterized by social mobility. That's right, within slavery, social mobility. People moving from one position to another. People moving from one type of work to another. How does that happen? Through initiative, lobbying for it, asking for it, pushing for it. These former slaves proudly recorded their determination, initiative, hard work, and achievements despite all the barriers they faced due to their enslaved status. But occupying a more privileged status in the plantation pecking order sometimes carried risks moral or social compromise, the narratives point those out too. Creating social distinctions among the enslaved let slaveholders encourage opportunism and jockeying for privileges between those who had access to privilege, however meager those privileges may have been. And of course, remember that any privilege that could be bestowed could be rescinded immediately for any reason, for no reason at all. Probably the best known feature of the African American slave narrative is its portrayal of the fugitive slave as an African American culture hero, the epitome of single-minded, fearless dedication to a great ideal, freedom and the dignity that accrues to anyone willing to risk all to attain freedom. However, while we justly and rightly celebrate the fugitives who risk everything for freedom, some of the narratives including some of the most famous ones, display class-inflected thinking by representing the fugitives as an exemplary minority. Particularly fascinating are those narratives that dramatize both sides of what must have been an excruciating moral dilemma for many who contemplated escape, and, and many may have contemplated it who never went through it. Did a personal life individual freedom for oneself. Take moral precedence over love and responsibility to one's enslaved family. I'll give you one example of this excruciating dilemma. It's a seldom read slave narrative by Francis Frederick, published in England in 1862. It illustrates a scene of parting that I think uh, is rarely discussed or noticed in many of these narratives. I'm, I'm not talking about scenes of separation when families are separated due to a slaveholder's greed, or a slaveholder goes broke and has to sell members of his family, uh, his so-called uh, colored family, uh, because uh, he needs a money. I'm talking about scenes of parting in which a family is about to be sundered because Someone in the family has decided to run away. These scenes appear, but they're never discussed. But I talk about them in my book. We are so disposed today to applaud the fugitive's dedication to personal freedom, I think, that scholars tend to ignore the scenes of parting because these wrenching scenes complicate the whole question of how do you decide that one person's freedom is more important than loyalty to family or love of family itself. And here's an example. Francis Frederick describes the night before he chooses to escape from, from Kentucky. How I long to tell them, that is, his mother and his sister, 
and bid them farewell. I hesitated several times when I thought I should never see them more. I turned back again and again to look at my mother. I knew she would be flogged as old as she was for my escape. I could foresee how my master would stand over her with the lash to extort from her my hiding place. I was her only son left. How she would suffer on suffer torture on my account and be distressed that I had left her forever until we should meet thereafter in heaven, I hoped. At length, I walked rapidly away as if to leave my thoughts behind me. He never told his mother that he was going to run. <clears throat> Consider the complex of emotions whipsawing this man on the eve of his escape. Could he justify a bid for freedom if it meant his own mother would be tortured? Frederick hoped he could protect his mother by keeping his escape plans to himself, but he also didn't want to admit to her that he, her only son left, was preparing to leave her forever. Not, not only uh, did he not want to uh, forewarn her, uh, he did not really want to have to discuss the fact that she was likely to be tortured in the wake of his escape. So he walked away. He told her no. This scene of powerful suppressed feeling strongly evinces, I believe, a sense of regret and guilt. And it's not just in this one narrative. There are other narratives that uh, deal with the same matter. Frederick's scene of parting suggests that escape from slavery did not provide him closure for his conflicted thoughts about the fates of his still enslaved mothers and sisters. His narrative bears witness to a lingering sense of obligation to acknowledge, if not confess, the long-term costs of his private decision to escape. Several important slave narratives end in haunting accounts of ambiguous loss, among the most powerful testimonies we have in American history and literature. Those who achieved their freedom knew the price they would have to pay. They would have to leave their loved ones for. If their bid for freedom failed, they would lose their loved ones because captured fugitives usually would be beaten and sold away. If the fugitive was successful, the result was the same. So whether the fugitive succeeds or fails, he or she still loses. They lose family in exchange for freedom. In spite of the danger, we see that these people go ahead. James W.C. Pennington, who fled slavery in Maryland to become a Presbyterian minister and civil rights activist in New York, was tortured by the thought on the eve of his escape that his family might be dissolved and sold as retaliation for his escape. A 13-member intact enslaved family. Mother, father, and, a, and, and ten brothers and sisters. Did he have the right, he asked himself, to go for slavery if the result would be that the whole family would suffer retaliation? Did he have the right to attempt to get his own freedom? There's a scene of parting in that, in that book, too, and he never tells anyone in his family that he's going to run. Not long after he gained his freedom, he discovered that his family, in fact, had been sold as retaliation. And also because the, the, the enslaver thought that if one Pennington will run, then more of them will run. I had better sell them before I lose control of them entirely. In a letter, reprinted in his widely selling 1849 narrative entitled The Fugitive Blacksmith, he wrote a letter to his family. This is part of what it said. About 17 
long years have now passed, rolled away since in the providence of Almighty God, I left your embraces and set out upon a daring adventure in search of freedom. Since that time, I have felt most severely the loss of the sun, moon, and 11 stars from my social sky. Many, many a thick cloud of anguish has pressed my brow and sent deep down into my soul the bitter waters of sorrow and consequence. Hear the anguish that this man is suffering all these years later over the consequences. If the course I took in leaving made your condition worse, I do most heartily regret such a change. I have no means of making atonement but by sincere prayer to Almighty God in your behalf. James W.C. Pennington became a minister, a very famous minister, in the United States and abroad. In his letter to his family, he is creating as eloquent a statement of ambiguous loss on the part of a successful fugitive slave as exists in all the slave narratives. When we celebrate the heroism of escapees like Douglas or Harriet Jacobs, or William and Ellen Craft, Josiah Henson, Henry Bibb, we must not reckon with only part of the emotional power of these accounts. We must also pay attention to how excruciatingly difficult and troubling such escapes could be for those who left behind, in many cases, the loved ones who had nurtured the pride, courage, fortitude, and aspiration that inspired most of the fugitives to begin with. Slave narratives contain stories of pathos as well as triumph, deep and abiding loss as well as wonderful achievements and fulfillment. The aim of my book is to open up the narratives, the famous and the largely forgotten, to attest to their full emotional power, their full moral complexity, their relevance to our world today. The perpetrators of American slavery insisted that all whites needed to know about enslaved people was that they were all the same, an undifferentiated, nameless, faceless mass of productivity and profit. By offering white American readers, for the first time, images of individualized slaves, dignified and determined, slave narratives portrayed such individuals as rightful American inheritors of what Martin Luther King Jr. called the promissory note of the Declaration of Independence. My book, Slavery and Class in the American South, is designed to show how much can also be learned if we direct our attention to the breadth depth of social, interpersonal relationships among the enslaved, particularly those that emerged from work, status, privilege, family, and class, which undergirded the self-awareness and ultimate resistance to slavery of fugitives across the antebellum South. Thank you very much. We paid our dues all those years And it's so nice to be switching gears It's a grand new century And it's the senior life, the senior life, the senior life for me